Sorry about that. Is it on now? Okay. All right. Uh, it's great to hear all of the interesting research you're doing, and it seems like there's a lot of overlap um, in what I do, and so I'm happy to uh, kind of continue the conversation um, after the talk. Um, so today I'm going to be presenting on a specific paper that I'm currently getting ready to submit for publication, uh, but I'm happy to talk to you afterwards about my general research interests and also for the postdocs, the first year of assistant professorhood and what that transition has been like. Um, if you do a quick Google news search for the term resilience, you'll get many different types of stories, ranging from stories on ecological resilience to psychological resilience uh, to resilience of sports teams. And these definitions of resilience really uh, mirror the broad definitions that we have of resilience in academia as well. You probably are all familiar with um, the foundational definition of resilience um, by Holling in 1973, which really focuses on the persistence of systems and their ability to absorb change and then to maintain the same relationships um, between populations and variables over time. But we have different definitions from different schools of thought. Um, engineering focuses much more on the ability of systems to withstand change and to uh, avoid damage. Psychology focuses much more on the ability of individuals to overcome adversity. And when we think about urban resilience, in the green on the left, the federal government kind of borrows from all of these different definitions, thinking about the ability to anticipate, to prepare for, to adapt to, and then to withstand, respond to, and recover rapidly from disruptions. But there's a lot of different definitions of urban resilience out there. Um, which makes this field a little bit confusing. Despite the fact that there's multiple definitions of resilience, we've really gone ahead um, as policymakers in using the idea of resilience as a good thing that we would like to pursue and having these large initiatives to try and support resilience at the city scale. So, um, for example, one of the most known initiatives was the 100... Uh, the one billion resilience, um, resilience, I'm sorry, now I'm forgetting the name of it. The one billion uh, resilience uh, competition, which was hosted by HUD after Sandy, which engaged cities and states across the country in developing projects and plans to build resilience. And then from those kind of narrowing the communities down um, to focus on a few select projects. And a lot of the projects that ended up receiving funding are different in their ability to cross traditional disciplines, thinking about building green infrastructure and providing job training, for example, and kind of doing things differently in these cities that uh, received the funding. In addition, uh, there's been multiple guidance developed by federal agencies. Um, on the right, there's a clip from uh, the National Institute of Science and Technologies uh, guidance for planning for community resilience. And just last week, the EPA uh, released a new indice to measure resilience of all the counties in the U.S. And so resilience has really been embraced by government and by policymakers um, as a goal that we're trying to pursue. And you probably have all also heard of 100 resilient cities where philanthropies are also entering into this space. Um, the 100 Resilient Cities was a, or is a, uh, $165 million initiative that was started by the Rockefeller Foundation. And as the name implies, it has brought together 100 cities from across the globe and brought them kind of into this program to help them build resilience uh, through planning and other projects. And in many ways, resilience has kind of taken over um, the space that climate change adaptation once kind of occupied in our policy areas. Um, and we're seeing kind of this shift in using the term resilience instead of climate change adaptation. And while this might just seem like 
a semantic question, this shift might actually have some important implications for the policies that cities are pursuing and the outcomes of those policies. And so that's really what I'm going to be focusing on today, is how is resilience, this very fuzzy concept, actually translated in planning for cities? And then also, how does this resilience planning differ from climate change adaptation plans, um, which might be a different alternative uh, for cities to prepare for climate change? And it's particularly important to address these questions at this moment because communities are already facing the impacts of climate change. And as you guys here in Annapolis probably have experienced, um, Maryland is kind of at the forefront in some ways of experiencing uh, these consequences of climate change uh, with roads flooding during high tides, um, shifts in public health issues, um, and climate change really has broad reaching impacts that's affecting kind of every component of cities from transportation and infrastructure, public health, economic development. And this really raises the question of how will cities respond? And one of the first things that cities are beginning to do is creating these adaptation plans. And um, these plans essentially do two things. The first is that they assess local vulnerability, so they look at what is going to be changing in that community, how are climate projections going to be changing, and then also what within the community is sensitive to those changing climate conditions, um, so whether it's health or transportation or whatever it may be. And then second, to actually identify adaptation strategies to help the community prepare. And the idea behind this is that adaptation planning can reduce the cost of climate change by proactively preparing for consequences. Um, so rather than waiting for something, for a disaster to strike um, and to respond retroactively, to think about doing something in, in a different way, thinking long term about um, the investments we're making and making sure that they last as long as intended or have the outcomes that we intend. And in some ways, the goals of resilience planning seem to overlap with the goals um, of adaptation in terms of thinking long term, in terms of thinking about how we can um, kind of improve future conditions. Um, but it's an open question. So what I did for this project was evaluate um, the first 10 plans released by U.S. cities in the 100 Resilient Cities Program, and then compare it to 44 local adaptation plans in the U.S., um, which I had previously analyzed, and then paired that comparison with um, interviews uh, with city officials engaged in resilience planning. So uh, the 10 plans that I looked at from 100 Resilient Cities include Atlanta, Berkeley, Boston, Boulder, New Orleans, New York City, Norfolk, Oakland, Pittsburgh, and San Francisco. So we have a pretty broad um, geographic coverage with these plans. And this is um, a convenient sample because by participating in 100 resilient cities, we are confident that these are resilience plans um, which is something that can be hard to define, what is a resilience plan in the first place. But with that convenience comes some limitations. Um, as participants in 100 resilient cities, these cities all applied to be in the program, so there is some self-selection bias here um, to participate. And then also, they are in the program, and so they have gone through the same processes as each other. So 100 Resilient Cities um, provides for its members funding to hire a chief resilience officer. So that's essentially a new position within city government um, that Rockefeller provides funding for. So they all kind of have that in common. And then they also go through the same process of developing a plan that Rockefeller has developed in terms of having modules, having targets to meet, and so there are some similarities between these plans that are likely due to just the program 
and may not be because they're focused on resilience. And that is kind of a future question that remains uh, to be addressed. And then I compared those 10 plans um, to 44 other uh, kind of adaptation plans from across the country. Uh, the cities are shown here on the map. And these 44 plans are all from local governments. So they are all city or county plans. Uh, they were all re released before January of 2015. That's just when we stopped collecting data for this particular part of the project. So they're a little bit older. Um, there are more plans now that are out there. And also these plans all focus on adaptation. So the main goal of these documents was to address climate change. It's not a sustainability plan with a single chapter on adaptation. And they all take a community perspective on the issue. So rather than just focusing on transportation or focusing on public health, they are really thinking about community-wide issues. And the results from that um, analysis have previously been published. Um, and also that data is publicly available. So I know you guys here are all about synthesizing existing data sets. If you're interested in that, the data is out there, um, and I'm happy to talk more about where that is and how to access it. Okay, so I said I evaluated these plans. What on earth does that mean? For those of you that aren't planners, that can mean a lot of different things. In planning, when we talk about plan evaluation, essentially what we mean is developing a checklist of the things that we think are important for plans to include, and then systematically reading our plans and seeing if, do they include these items that we think are important. Um, and typically we look at six different types of kind of general things in these plans. Some of them are pretty self-evident. We want our plans to have goals. Um, that's almost the whole point of developing a plan, is to provide a future vision for a community. In addition to goals, we expect plans to include fact-based, to have empirical foundation um, that kind of identifies important issues for the, for the community, as well pro as provide the foundation for the strategies that are proposed in the plan. So when we're thinking about climate change, that might be things like projections, as well as identifying specific um, components of a community that are vulnerable. Uh, we expect plans to include strategies to get us to achieving our goals. We also hope that all plans engage the public in the process, um, that there's coordination between different stakeholders within the community. And then we also hope that all plans don't just sit on a shelf somewhere and actually have guidance uh, to help us take the actions that are proposed and put them into action, to make them actually happen in the world. And so we want them to have implementation and monitoring uh, components. And then lastly, um, in this study, we're also looking at how plans address uncertainty, which is not commonly looked at, but we think is particularly important um, when we think about climate change and we think about potentially multiple different types of futures and needing to be adaptive and responsive um, to what the future looks like. So for each of these different principles, each of these principles, we include multiple metrics. So for example, in uncertainty, we might look to see if a plan acknowledges uncertainty, just to see if it even recognizes that there's uncertainty in climate change projections or in how we estimate vulnerability. And if that's present, then we would code one for yes, it's there, or zero for no, it's not. And from those um, presence and absence scores, we can score each principle and then each plan overall. Uh, it's important to note that each principle does not have the same number of metrics. So we have many more items in the fact base that we're looking for. Uh, but when we calculate the scores for each principle, we look at percentages. So that accounts for some of that variation. Um, 
but it is important to note that having 22 items in your fact base still only gets you 50% of the points, even though that could be quite a bit of information. Um, and so, for example, if the plan only includes one of the six goal metrics, it would get a 17% on that principle, and we could carry that through for each of the principles, and then we calculate the overall score for the plan by averaging the principal scores. So again, it's important to know we are not weighting each of the metrics equally, but we're weighting each of the principles equally, because we think that a plan needs to have goals, it needs to have the fact base, and so the principles are more on par with each other than any of the given principle, any of the given metrics, I'm sorry. Um, and I'm happy to ask more questions about that. Um, all of the plans are double coded, so that means two people go through and read them and look for those metrics, and that gives us a little bit more confidence that we aren't having one person that's thinking that, oh, all of these plans address uncertainty um, and be able to reconcile the differences and be more confident in our uh, results. Okay, so how did these resilience plans score? Um, on the metrics we were interested in. So on average, plans score 47% of the possible points, with scores ranging from 30 to 60%. Um, and if you look at the, the scores on plan principles, you see there's large variation across these plan principles, uh, where plans are doing a relatively good job on goals and public participation and coordination but are really being pulled down by their fact base and uncertainty scores. So how does this compare to the adaptation plans? Uh, on the far left, no, far right for you guys, um, is the aggregate uh, plan quality, so the overall scores, and there you don't see a significant difference between the scores, uh, but you do see that there's a very different pattern across these plan principles, uh, where there's a significant difference between the scores on the goals, on public participation, on coordination, on fact base, on uncertainty. Uh, and so this kind of indicates that these plans are taking different approaches to thinking about climate change and providing different avenues for cities to prepare. So I'll talk a little bit more about kind of some of these differences substantive, substantively and what those differences actually look like in the plans. Um, and it's also important to note before going into that, that some of these differences, again, may be due to the program itself. So especially when we think about goals, um, you know, the 100, Rock of the 100 RC program might require the cities to develop specified goals and then develop their plan around them versus adaptation plans, which were much more ad hoc and tend to score much lower there. There was a question? Yeah. Yeah, so that uh, you guys use the metric plan, right? Is it true that if you could give more of a sense of if the book has had a foundation, how much of the trajectory aligns with those different principles, whether you guys actually do so? So you actually have done some survey with the RC program. Mm -hmm. uh, could you just you know, bring to mind the principles? Is there something similar <coughs> that requires adaptation plans? Um, <coughs> so I'll start with the adaptation plans. Um, the history, so the first one was published in 2005, and the most recent one we have was from 2015. So they're over that 10 year period. Um, they are very variable. Um, and so there is no single approach or single guidance that was used in preparing those plans. Uh, many of them kind of participated with ICLEI, which is, um, what is it, Global S City Sustainability? Does anyone know what ICLEI stands for? All right. Um, <laughs> which is a very active organization in the climate change uh, world and uh, many others were developed through um, federal relationships. So 
through things like um, climate ready estuaries, uh, was involved in developing about four of them. Some of them received state funding and new support. So it's really kind of a hodgepodge across the country. Some of them were written by consultants for the city. Um, and so that does describe some of the variation in the plan quality. Um, in terms of the 100 Resilient Cities program, it's private. So we don't know precisely on what they tell the cities to do and what not to do. Um, they have not made their process public. Um, I think they would lose value if they did that in some ways. Um, but it is clear that you know, defining goals is probably an important component of the planning process. Public participation is emphasized. Um, and so that still needs to be disentangled is kind of what is part of that program and what is part of resilience generally. And <laughs> so the cities apply and then they receive money to hire one person. And then they're also paired with a um, what they're called as a strategy partner. And so those tend to be larger consulting firms like ACOM um, that provide services to the city. So instead of giving the city money, they're essentially providing them with resources in kind. Um, and then also cities that are participating have access to the network of all the other participating cities and um, get to go through this process, which has modules and direction, but like I said, that part is not publicly available. Yes? What was the base of the, the uh, rock-paired cities? Are they in the same plan or So they tend to be newer. I'm trying to see if I, they have the dates on here. Um, so the oldest one is from, oldest ones are from 2015, so they tend to be newer plans. Yeah, so some of the thoughts on adaptation generally may also have changed. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Um, so talking about some of these difference here, differences here, I'll start with public participation where um, the resilience plans score much higher on public participation. And this is an excerpt from the Resilient Boston plan. And it kind of demonstrates the emphasis on public participation in their planning process, uh, where they engaged a huge number of people across the city in the process. Um, and this is much different than the typical adaptation plans, which tended to be much more technocratic and be driven much more um, by kind of technical information than public participation processes. Um, and in addition, these resilience plans have a much higher tendency to engage different groups like businesses in the process um, and neighboring jurisdictions, while the climate change adaptation plans tend to be kind of developed more isolated within, uh, within the government. In contrast, the 100 resilient cities uh, plans score much lower on uncertainty. In fact, none of the plans actually consider multiple scenarios in the, plan in the plan. None of them discuss adaptive management or how the city might go about learning from their implementation processes and incorporating that back into um, planning. And this is compared to adaptation plans where 70% of plans consider multiple scenarios, which is still not as high as we might hope, but is much higher than we see in these resilience plans. And where they're engaging much more in thinking about how are we going to address this uncertainty? How are we going to plan adaptively to incorporate flexible strategies and be robust to multiple futures? <coughs> We also see a, a difference in the types of fact base these types of plans have. So this is um, an image from Boston's adaptation plan. And this is very blurry, apparently. Um, 
but it's showing uh, the transportation areas and uh, kind of critical areas that may be affected by sea level rise in the future. And this type of map is pretty common for adaptation plans where they're identifying specific areas within a community that are potentially will be potentially affected by climate change in the future. And so thinking about how will climate change affect our built environment, thinking about how will it affect our public services and public health, and getting into much more specifics. Versus uh, resilience plans, which provides some information about climate change impacts, but tends to be um, at a much higher level and lacking some of that specific specificity and detail that we see in the adaptation plans. So this is a figure from the Resilient Boston Plan. Again, it has a good amount of information, but it tends to be taking some of those maps and some of that more specific vulnerability analysis and aggregating it to a higher level of thinking about what might the potential impacts of climate change be. The one area that resilience plans outperform adaptation plans in the fact base is thinking about vulnerable populations and also thinking about what causes vulnerability, where they're really reorienting the issue away from thinking about how can we protect our existing systems from an external kind of uh, consequences of climate change to thinking about how is our system actually producing vulnerability. And I think this excerpt from the Resilient Boston Plan actually does a pretty good job of capturing that thought um, where they're not saying that the groups that we often consider as vulnerable to climate change, um, such as the elderly or um, low-income individuals, are inherently vulnerable, but that they're vulnerable because of historic and systematic discrimination, exclusion, marginalization, exploitation, and underrepresentation. So really thinking about the fact that our existing systems are producing vulnerability and we need to think about strategies that address those underlying causes of vulnerability instead of just thinking about how can we protect our coastline or think about how can we protect our systems from these climate change consequences. And we see this reflected in the strategies that are being proposed in the plans as well. Um, so while there's not a statistical difference in the scores here, we do see a, subs a substantive difference where um, resilience plans put much more sh emphasis on capacity building, which we might think about as um, kind of developing the potential for future action. Um, and this excerpt from the Atlanta plan demonstrates kind of how broad some of these strategies are in terms of thinking about widening the um, opportunities for education and particularly focusing on pre-K education. And many of the strategies, I would say all of the resilience uh, strategies include some of these broader strategies that may not typically fall under the category of what we would think about cl as climate change adaptation. Uh, so another example from Atlanta, thinking about creating an investment checklist to ensure that there's equity in public investments, in Boston, um, many of their strategies are focused on addressing racial inequities. And so thinking about how can they engage community members in conversations and in workshops around racial equity. Um, in Norfolk, they have many strategies focused on economic development and enlivening uh, commercial quarters here. And this is in pretty sharp contrast to adaptation plans, which focus much more <coughs> on on the ground strategies to change kind of how communities are doing things, but focusing more on kind of protection strategies. So thinking about how might um, cities change their practices in terms of what tree species they might plant or their maintenance schedules, um, or looking at building more physical infrastructure or changing their land use approaches versus these um, resilient strategies that are really thinking more holistically about the community and thinking more about um, kind of how can we create more economic 
educational outcome, um, opportunities in our cities. Um, and that some of those strategies don't seem to really fall into any of the categories that we might tra traditionally think of as adaptation strategies. And in so some ways, our measurement tool is not really picking up uh, those differences in the strategies. <coughs> and this uh, difference is also illustrated in how the plans themselves define resilience. Um, so the definition of resilience that the 100 Resilient Cities program uses is the capacity of individuals, communities, institutions, businesses, and systems within a city to survive, adapt, and grow, no matter what kinds of chronic stresses and acute shocks. And so here, when they're talking about chronic stresses, they're incorporating those issues of poverty, of inequality, of aging infrastructure, along with sea level rise and some of the other climate change concerns we might have. Um, and when we look at how cities are taking that definition and operate, operationalizing it, they are tending to focus more on some of those kind of other issues and how they're interfacing with climate change than climate change them itself. So at the bottom here is Boston's definition of resilience for their city. And here you can see it's really e uh, focusing on equity, on how can they create equity and make sure that services reach all residents. And this, again, is in contrast to how resilience is defined in adaptation plans, which focuses specifically on how resilience is related to climate change. Um, so on the top is in a definition from Austin's plan where they define resilience as efforts to reduce the city's vulnerability to long-term changes in climate. And in New York City, um, again, it's focused on climate change. And so we're seeing this evolution in some ways over time of um, how resilience is used and how it's been brought in to incorporate some larger concepts beyond climate change. And this is really emphasized in the interviews with chief resilience officers and other city officials where they don't want resilience to be limited to climate change and they're really trying to move beyond climate change with their resilience planning efforts. And this reflect is reflected also in how those plans are going to be used. So um, while adaptation plans might kind of be a support tool for investments or eventually be integrated into other planning efforts, for resilience plans, they're really seeing it as a potential vision for the entire community, looking at how resilience can, in some cases, serve as kind of the strategic document or the comprehensive planning that guides the entire city's development in the future. And so um, thinking about kind of using resilience as an organizing concept uh, for the city. And in some cities, they've even changed their budgeting process to focus on this idea of resilience. So what are the implications of this um, kind of definition of resilience planning for adaptation? I think the first thing to note is that these are different approaches, that uh, the adaptation-focused plans and resilience-focused plans do have differences, um, and that there are trade-offs, apparently, between taking these different approaches. Uh, where resilience may be able to reorient the issue of climate change adaptation to focus more at, on underlying causes of vulnerability um, and also in doing so bring more people to the table that may not traditionally participate in climate change adaptation planning or policy making. Um, it potentially comes at a cost of some of the more detailed vulnerability assessments and measures to address uncertainty that we have traditionally seen in adaptation plans and arguably are important for preparing for climate change. <coughs> so 
just to wrap up here and leave plenty of time for questions and conversation, um, one of the critical kind of future directions is trying to explain potentially some of these uh, differences in whether these patterns would hold for a broader sample of resilience plans, so plans outside of 100 resilient cities. And there are starting to be resilience plans outside of 100 resilient cities, and there are starting to be chief resilience officers outside of the 100 resilient cities. In many ways, that program has ignited um, some action and interest in this idea around the country. Um, I think it's also really important to think more about what actors are engaged in these types of planning and whether it matters who is involved um, in terms of how the plans look. And I have a few projects kind of underway that are trying to tie social networks with planning networks and looking at, for example, if we all together are in a room, um, sharing ideas, that does that make the plans that we're creating separately connect better and have more consistency? And then also, clearly, perhaps the most important question is what's actually being implemented on the ground from these plans. And that's another area where I am trying to get some projects started, looking at what policies are cities actually adopting from these plans. and what is are th what is the meaning of these plans in terms of what's happening in cities. Um, so thank you so much for your attention and I'm happy to take questions and comments. Yeah. <laughs>